another set of brains and a fresh perspective are just a ticket for Chase's research to arrive at a viable solution. Despite the crumblings from high up, the Hextech is indeed possible, both Chase and Victor are certain of this. And as much as these two would love nothing more than nerd it out till the sun comes up, they are on a bit of a timer. All of Chase's equipment is set to be eradicated come morning, so if they are going to make a move, they have to do it now. The pair decide to sneak into Heimerdinger's lab to finalize their research. One last hurrah, come what may, show everyone that this magic power tech can work, even at the risk of being branded criminals. At this point, Jace has nothing to lose, and everything to gain. But as for Victor, this is a huge gambit. Even if they manage to get Hextech working, in the worst case, he might still suffer the same punishment as Jace. Both of them banished from the city, ambitions down the drain. Not to say that Jace's work wasn't risky from the start, he knew to keep his taboo act secret after all. But this bold drive that Victor has once he sees a path towards progress is something else entirely. He's already got a superb spot in society, a cushy job, and yet the possibility of creating something revolutionary outweighs it all. He doesn't even have to think about it. In fact, he's the one who coaxes Jace to go along with it. Why? Why would you risk this? Do you think it was my life's ambition to be an assistant? Scientists seek discoveries, ways to make the world a better place. This Hextech dream of yours has the potential to do that. Our Hextech dream. I like that a lot. This kind of recognition towards someone you've only just met is simply heartwarming. It further underlines the fact that Chase is indeed doing all of this for the good of everyone. He isn't seeking personal glory. There is not a trace of ego in the mix, Jace is a pure person. And suddenly, that key difference between him and the rest of the world is on show through Victor. His motivations are more centered around his own fascination for knowledge. Progress for progress's sake? In his mind, that's what science is for, a means to evolve the world. And those who are capable of evolving the world shouldn't be shackled by those who are afraid of the new and improved morrow. And unlike Chase, there is also a tiny bit of petty ambition in the mix as well. Contrast between the cast is a powerful tool for characterization. Even small deviations get highlighted when placed next to each other, making it easy to pinpoint who the characters are deep down. Also, I find it slightly amusing that all of this started with a bunch of kids trespassing in Chase's workshop, and now everything will be set right by Chase trespassing in someone else's workshop instead. Meanwhile, the kids are trespassing someplace else at that exact moment. Again, it's like poetry, so sort if of they rhyme. But more on that later. At this point, since the story and world of Arcane are on the verge of a major magical technological advancement, it's the perfect time to take a proper look at the namesake of the show. What is the Arcane in the show Arcane? How does magic work in the show? And what exactly is its purpose as a narrative tool? Now for the sake of this specific conversation, whenever I henceforth say magic, I'm using it as a blanket term for anything fantastical within a story. That includes supernatural entities, events, creatures, as well as fantastic technology. Let's face it, fiction often treats advanced technology the exact same as if it were magic. This thing exists, don't think about it. The people of this universe are so smart they can create these wonders. That's just the way it is. There's no true basis on any kind of legit scientific process. Arcane itself does that silly trope where everything having to do with technology is only ever called the science. All my life I've pursued the mysteries of science. As if there aren't hundreds of different fields falling under that umbrella. Every scientifically inclined person is presented as a super genius who can effortlessly understand innovate, and build things from scratch. Alone. Everyone knows everything about any field they just so happen to need, from mineralogy, 
to metallurgy, to biology, to electronics. All fields of physics and chemistry are the same. No need to dedicate one's life to one field to be an expert. It's all just science. Unlike in our world, where every great leap in technology requires the work of entire teams of experts with different specialities, this kind of omni-learned inventor can only be found in fiction. Not a criticism towards this show specifically, simply an observation about the nature of storytelling at large. The fact that Arcane has Chase and Victor working as a pair is already a step up from the popular lone scientist archetype in terms of realism. With that said, before moving on to the details of magic in Arcane, it's valid to start by dissecting the general use of magic in fiction. Why would an author wish to add this specific element into their story? Why not simply tell a grounded, realistic story? Broadly speaking, there are three distinct storytelling utilities for magic. Spectacle, function, and allegory. Spectacle is exactly that. People want excitement, people want escapism. Something completely removed from their grey everyday boredom. Flashy lights, mystery and whimsy, epic set pieces, grand battles. Magic is a blunt way to offer exactly that. This is also the most shallow aspect of magic. It's the flame of the story, while the audience are the moths flocking towards the intriguing light. It's nice to look at, but if the author gives too much focus to this aspect alone, while ignoring any kind of deeper substance, then the story has no hope of being anything more than a rule of cool romp. Entertaining for sure, but ultimately pointless. Function refers to the physical role that fantastical elements serve within the universe. When an author crafts a setting for their story, there are several decisions they must make when it comes to culture and technology. The author may wish to have it so that this one specific thing is possible in their world, so that the story will flow in their desired direction. Conversely, they may wish have it so that some common utility of our world is unheard of in the fictional one. Example, despite being the city of progress, Piltover doesn't have any kind of method for instant long-distance communication. No radio, no telephone, the best they have is a network of pneumatic tubes for mail. At the same time, this city will soon offer warp gates for merchant vessels across the realm, making it a grand hub for trading. It's a different world, they have different resources, so technology advances through divergent paths from our own. The author can use fantastical elements to fine-tune their world and justify the differences from reality. Allegory is the opposite from spectacle. This is the substance. What is the author trying to convey with their tale? What are the themes? How does the existence of magic shape the destinies of the people? Is the gift of magic a rarity or an everyday thing? Will it bring prosperity or create conflict? A storyteller can do so much with the power of imagination, not just entertain, but say something meaningful. The substance of Spider-Man isn't the cool superhero fights, it's the great power, great responsibility part. How does a person react to overwhelming power being gifted to them? And that is only the most basic possibility that magic offers. By setting their tale in a completely fictional universe where the rules of nature and possibilities of technology are different from our own, the author is freed from certain amounts of baggage, such as the customs of our modern world or historical context. The author can examine the human condition in very specific ways by creating a unique speculative scenario, setting up the rules to the finest detail, and then having their characters react to that scenario. Fantasy gives the chance to present things such as war, religion, and society in a purely symbolic way. Nothing has to relate to our world as a literal commentary or critique of a specific person, or event, or a group. It's just a portrait of humanity as a whole. There is a clean slate to do whatever the author wants. So that's the utility of magic and fantasy from an author's point of view. It's an effective storytelling tool with limitless potential. When used correctly, 
I personally don't believe that there's any kind of rigid list of do's and don'ts when it comes to magic. It all comes down to execution. The one universal piece of advice I can offer is the same as with every other aspect of storycraft. Keep the rules consistent. Magic inherently requires some level of suspension of disbelief from the audience. Fundamentally, there is no way to make magic make sense. Because it literally doesn't exist. That's what makes it fantasy. However, the author has to honor the audience's willingness to accept the unreal as real. So, if the author states that something functions in a specific way, then that same thing has to function in that exact same way going forth. It doesn't matter what the rules are, as long as the rules remain the same from beginning to end. Without rules, the audience won't know what's going on, there's no stakes, and without stakes, all story developments will be nothing more than random images and flashing lights. The author cannot just make shit up as they go along, or change rules on the fly. To do that is the exact same as to outright declare to the audience, you idiots will slurp up anything, I can just do whatever. Random stuff happening in a sequence is not storytelling, it's gibberish. This is the one and only law in storytelling. Put it on a t-shirt, wear it as your mantra. Now finally moving back to the main topic, the magic in Arcane is never given any kind of full explanation. A couple of vague statements here and there, and the rest comes down to visual context. Yet, with all the info that is given, I'd say the rules are quite simple and functional. Basically, there are three components needed to perform arcane arts. First, a person with born aptitude for magic. Second, a sequence of runes, which dictate the function of the spell. And third, these glowing blue gemstones, which act as the payment for the spell. After a sizable incantation, the energy drains, and the jewel turns into mundane rock. That's the rigid literal description. That's just how it works. As for the specific justification for where exactly this talent comes from is left abstract. There are mentions about the concept of Arcane itself as a great semi-sentient entity. What have we been looking at it backwards? We've been trying to discover runes that invoke specific effects and then molding them to a useful function. Tools, as you like to put it. But, but... If the legends are true, mages aren't bound to single functions. It said the arcane speaks through them. Or perhaps a different plane of existence altogether. It's all about these runes. They form some kind of mathy, magic-y gateway. To the realm of heebie-jeebies. Yes, that. It's implied that the arcane, whatever it is, has the ability to bend the laws of nature, and those lucky enough to be born with the ability to resonate with this all-encompassing force, can guide it to do their bidding. I can't say why the arcane requires payment in the form of glowy gemstone energy. Mana points for balancing? The idea of Hextech is to use the same method as mages to harness the arcane, the runes act as the language to give it commands, the gemstones function as the energy source, the crucial difference is to replace the human component with advanced machinery, so that anyone can resonate with the arcane and perform magic. It's coherent enough explanation, and these rules are kept consistent throughout. It's more than we get on average. Thumbs up from me. The only gripe I have is with the gemstones and the world building implications. First of all, they aren't given a proper name. That should tell you all you need about the show's slapdash attitude. They are referred to as Hextech gems later on, but that is obviously not their original name. What is this mineral? Where is it mined? And what is it used for originally? Nothing is excavated without a reason. I refuse to believe there is large enough market of mages to sustain an entire mining operation. 
so there must be some other use for this mineral other than magic. So what is it? Not to mention the fact that this gem is extremely volatile by nature. So how exactly does one remove it from the earth without it exploding in their faces? This nameless, seemingly purposeless gemstone that still somehow exists is a really lame plot device. They are the central component of the namesake of this show, and yet they are given no background. And it's not just the gems themselves, but who holds control of them. The moment Hextech becomes viable, the people who own the mines should be major players in the politics of Piltover. They own the literal fuel that makes the city function. That is a huge deal, and it's not brought up once. It's not a deal breaker, just bizarre oversight compared to everything it's surrounded by. But the specific ways in which the supernatural works isn't nearly as important as what its existence means to the world of Arcane. Chase and Victor are about to unleash something enormous. A technology that can potentially place unlimited reality bending powers in the hands of anyone. We've already seen a glimpse at what mages can do, and that is when their intentions are noble. It is stated that part of the reason Piltover was first founded was to offer a bastion within a world ravaged by the destructive ambitions of mages. It is not a secret that magic is extremely dangerous, and power has an alluring intoxicating effect to it. In the wrong hands, this technology will end up manifesting all the darkest sides of humanity, people thinking themselves to be gods amongst men. The danger is obvious. And yet, the potential to build, to heal, to feed, to nurture is just as great. Magic and Hextech represent both the possibilities and perils of innovation. Should this door be opened, so that we can enjoy the convenience it offers, or should it be locked forever because of all the suffering that it might possibly cause? That dilemma and the exploration of all the human destinies this decision will affect is the substantive aspect of magic. Arcane manages to deliver on all three storytelling utilities of magic. It offers high spectacle, it is awe-inspiring to witness, it has a clear world-building function, its very existence justifies the state of the world, and it works wonderfully in allegorical sense as well, as a vehicle for potentially endless philosophical musings. It is fantastic, in both senses of the term. But before getting ahead of ourselves, we gotta open that door. The plan isn't exactly complex. Sneak in, tinker a bit, complete the whatchamacallit, that's all everyone, profit. So naturally, everything goes without much resistance. So far so good. <laughs> Willing to risk exile for your endeavor. That's quite the conviction. A counselor! Wait a minute, oh, it's a bedroom. See you. Huh? Could I <laughs> With a little help from Mel Medarda, a councilwoman who is most fascinated by Jace and the potential of his research, to the point of passive aggressively ensuring his lenient sentence. Even if you manage to prove your theory, the council would destroy it. Heimendinger will recognize the potential. <laughs> he already does. It scares him. It scares them all. What about you? I recognize that any worthwhile venture involves risk. One night, gentlemen. Impress me, or I'd suggest you pack your bags. I have no idea what exactly she is doing here. Did she assume Chase would try something like this? That's some mighty sharp intuition. Better watch out for this one. Anyway, the lady graciously distracts the guardsman long enough to give the eggheads time to finish their work. The thing about flashy magic is that the obvious azure light will invite more eyes at the scene eventually. Good lord, what is happening in there? Aurora Borealis? Uh, Aurora Borealis! At this time of year, at this time of day, in this part of the country, localized entirely within... <laughs> A 
and as dramatic timing would dictate, the pair get their gizmo working at the exact moment the opposition busts in, led by Heimerdinger himself. You've actually done it. But just because it can be done doesn't mean... Will you please stop hovering? The fully realized, functioning, stable Hextech is a marvel to behold. Seeing is believing. The promise of a future where technology is only limited by one's imagination is an attractive one. Even Heimdinger, the most intense critic of the idea, eventually falls. Partly because he realizes he's fighting a losing battle here. The tempt of the arcane is too strong. Everyone will want a piece of this. Mel is advocating for it, and she has a tendency of getting her way. All Heimerdinger can really do at this point is to become involved and make sure this technology is developed safely. His willingness to concede ground here is most likely helped by his belief in both Chase and Victor. With these two idealistic men at the helm, surely the direction of Hextech will be a prosperous one. Time will tell. And as always, a massive thanks to each of you for sticking around for this long. And a special thanks to all the supporters on Patreon, as well as an extra special thanks to my 10 euro supporters, Wyland, Jesaja Vanderwatt, Six Stars, Danny Kicks, and Clark Daniel Ivory. If you would like to join these fine people, or check out any of my other creative stuff, all the links are down below. Take care everyone, and I'll see you all in the next one.